Shirin. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Shirin at Tarabolsky, and uh, I am a senior researcher with ODI, which is a research institute in London, uh, uh, working on governance uh, and humanitarian issues. We have launched an initiative uh, with ODI focusing on the Mediterranean uh, region and on peace building and economic uh, collaboration called ODI Med and this is uh, the second webinar uh, in a series of webinar we are organizing uh, in the framework of ODI Med and the gov governance and politics uh, uh, project uh, in ODI. I welcome all of you and I hope that you are able to listen uh, to my voice and to my interpretation also clearly and if there are any issues you can um, notify us uh, with the chat box uh, i welcome all of you and i thank you once again for uh, partaking to this webinar which is a part of a collaboration between odi and usip that we are uh, what that we that we cherish uh, particularly as uh, both institutions work and focus on peace building in the Arab world and around the world. Uh, our webinar today, uh, which I will be moderating, uh, comprises a set of uh, senior and uh, honorable researchers um, in peace studies and uh, in peace building. And the aim behind this webinar is to shed light on a very important topic, which is the impact of COVID-19 on peace building uh, locally in the MENA region. There are different views and opinions and uh, several research um, pieces uh, published about the issue. Some of them are pessimistic, uh, regarding the impact of COVID-19 on social cohesion and on the different uh, conflict zones and uh, some of them are more uh, or rather optimistic because COVID-19 has created a, uh, a political and social scene that is propitious and conducive to peace building but uh, it's very important and uh, crucial that we listen uh, to different uh, stakeholders and actors from these countries, uh, from the MENA region. And uh, in this webinar, we will focus on the Yemeni and Iraqi and Syrian experiences. And we will discuss also the impact on the whole MENA region in general. We'll focus on different axes. And uh, as I said in the beginning, we'll focus on the impact of COVID-19 uh, from a critical perspective and uh, from a, a first-hand experience uh, on the ground in the MENA region on the economic, uh, social and political spheres in these countries and the repercussions of uh, uh, COVID-19 on peace making on the short, mid and long terms and uh, uh, the impact uh, the impact of uh, uh, this uh, COVID on economies and the war economies uh, um, that we have in the MENA region. We will discuss also issues pertaining to misinformation and disinformation on social media or uh, um, uh, classical media and uh, does it uh, and what kind of uh, impact does it have on the ground and I will discuss also the role of uh, international organizations in supporting peace countries in peace building and what is the best role to be played particularly in this uh, situation of conflict. Before introducing the different panelists we have today, uh, I would like to give the word of, or the opening address to Mrs. Uh, um, 
Catherine uh, Nawajiako, uh, with, and uh, she is the Director of Politics and Governance in ODI, and then to Ms. To Dr. Eli Abouan, the head of uh, or the director of uh, the MENA programs in USIP. Uh, Catherine, you. over to you. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this joint USIP ODI event entitled The Impact of COVID 19 on Local Peace Building in the Middle East. ODI is delighted to co-host this event as part of its ODI MED initiative in partnership with the Politics and Governance Programme. Its purpose? To facilitate policy-focused research and dialogue on the underlying economic, social, including cultural, and political dynamics that, the that, that underpin conflict and violence in the region in its multiple forms. This event is particularly timely, given that we in ODI's politics and governance team are embarked on our own strategic redefinition of our conflict related work, part of which includes rethinking peace building. The repercussions, real or anticipated, of COVID-19 on conflict dynamics worldwide has been the subject of sustained international attention ever since the UN Secretary General called for a universal ceasefire in the wake of the outbreak of the pandemic in March 2020, in order to limit the spread of the virus and facilitate access to much needed humanitarian assistance. Much of this attention has focused on whether or not peace building, peace agreements have taken place Ceasefires are being ignored and the politics of the pandemic are playing out in ways that have enabled conflict and violence rather than deterred them. There is less interest, however, now in so-called local peace building efforts and in how they have affected, they have been affected by the COVID pandemic. Yet we know that in highly fractured conflict affected settings, in which social cohesion is further challenged by COVID-19, local peace builders, builders are the unsung heroes, playing a critical role in strengthening community resilience in the face of conflict and violence at a micro level, and in rebuilding ties that bind and in, re and in negotiating humanitarian action, access and protection for civilians, in particular for vulnerable groups. How are local peace building efforts in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, how are they um, coping with the impacts of COVID on peace in the short and long term? These are the questions that I'm sure you'll have course to deliberate on. So I'm delighted, therefore, that ODI with USIP are co-hosting an event focused on local peace building in the Middle East in order to shine much needed spotlight on this issue in a region, which is often associated more with war than peace. So I very much look forward to hearing from all of you, panelists and participants, concrete ideas for continued collaboration between USIP and ODI, and why not the development of a joint research agenda, building on our respective competences and shared desire to build back together better. So I look forward to hearing the discussions and wish you all a successful event. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Shokran, Catherine, and um, Ustaz Ili, Faddal. Yes, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Shireen. I was asked thank to you. use English for my opening remarks, so I will comply with the request although I had a different uh, preference, but that's fine. So good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I know some people are joining us uh, from different time zones. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, which is a second, uh, a second collaboration between USIP and ODI, a collaboration that looks very promising. Uh, and I would like to see Gant, Catherine, and you know, at least contemplating the possibilities of developing a joint research agenda or different types of collaboration. Uh, 
uh, as uh, Shireen mentioned, we did organize a previous event on North Africa, and this, is, uh, this one is focused on Middle East, more specifically Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Uh, so, a few words about the Institute. USIP is a, a nonpartisan independent institute uh, founded by the Congress in 1984. And our mandate is to uh, prevent, violent, prevent and mitigate violent conflict. Uh, we achieve our mandate or we fulfill our mandate through three types of programming. Uh, we build the capacities of, uh, uh, of uh, local actors both governmental and non-governmental on issues related to peace building and conflict management and prevention. The second type of program is uh, the research and the policy work, which is basically our think tank function. And the third one is our engagement on the ground, mostly through community-based dialogues, uh, different types and models of dialogues that I will spare you the details for now. Uh, but th that would be the third type of programs that we we implement and uh, specifically in the Middle East and North Africa, we are active since 2003. Uh, uh, and uh, we started obviously in Iraq. Uh, uh, and over the years, uh, we have uh, implemented several projects and we uh, facilitated several dialogues, uh, including establishing uh, a strategy or helping with the establishment of a, an Iraqi-led organization that became later on our strategic partner and uh, the name of the uh, organization is Sanad for Peace Building. And uh, we have one of the panelists today coming from Sanad, which is uh, a great uh, reward for USIP's efforts is to see Sanad you know, being featured in these events. Uh, the, a lot has been uh, written or said about the effects of pandemic on local peace building uh, or on peace building in general. Uh, there are definitely challenges and opportunities presented by this pandemic. Uh, however, our observation is that there are specific types of anxieties that uh, are somehow either stronger or different from previous uh, similar situations. Uh, you know, the first anxiety comes from the, you know, the, the very basic uh, situation of being in a pandemic. So basically not knowing whether someone will contract the virus or not. So basically an, an anxiety about your own well-being. The second type of anxiety is about the future. You know, given the uncertainty and the divisions among the uh, scientific community in the world, uh, I think people are also not, are not only anxious about whether they will get sick or not, they are also anxious about what will happen next, about uh, you know, when they will resume their normal activities, when they will be able to travel, uh, when they will see their relatives. Uh, and the third, uh, and the, the third point that I would like to mention here is as a result of these anxieties uh, combined and other anxieties, you know, coming from the economic uh, de uh, depression that everyone is for, is already not forecasting anymore. I think we're we're in fully in in the depression at this stage, but the mindset and the priorities of people have shifted. So the same actors with whom we were working before, uh, you know, are still engaging with us and they are still you know discussing and trying to do something. But we can certainly feel that their priorities have shifted uh, from you know, looking into social cohesion matters or reconciliation or dialogue issues to uh, more of a survival mode, I would say. Uh, in Iraq, <coughs> you know, despite these challenges, we were able to uh, finalize two reconciliation agreements, uh, one in Libya and one in Iraq. In Iraq, and which is the focus of this webinar, uh, we worked together with our strategic partner, Sanad, on uh, an agreement in Tal Afar. Tal Afar is a, for those who know Iraq or the history of Iraq, Tal Afar is a very, very well-known uh, city uh, in northern Iraq uh, because it, you know, it used to be the hotbed of a lot of terrorist activities at some point. Um, and uh, it is considered one of the complex uh, locations uh, to, to work uh, on in Iraq. Nevertheless, uh, we are really proud that we were able to finalize the agreement during the pandemic. Uh, obviously, the work on, on this dialogue track started in 2015, so it's roughly five years of work uh, that culminated in this agreement in, um, you know, last month. Uh, in, uh, in Syria, we, uh, you know, we, because of many factors, not only the pandemic, but our focus at this stage 
uh, is to continue building the capacity of our local partner. So we did not work on dialogues per se in the last few months. Uh, again, not only because of the pandemic, but also because of other developments on the ground. Uh, and from, you know, uh, from, from this, uh, from the work that we've done during the pandemic, we've realized uh, how much the logistical uh, challenges are weighing on, uh, on our ability to implement programs uh, in, in the conflict areas. And when I, men when I say logistic uh, challenges, I mentioned the fact that we are not able to do in-person activities anymore, that we are not able to travel anymore. You know, bringing in experts is not as easy as before, if not impossible. But in addition to these challenges, logistical challenges, uh, we felt also what I just described before, which is the, how the priorities and the mindset of people have shifted. Uh, so I really hope that the three speakers will, uh, will give us additional insights into these challenges. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, explaining what we've been through, but uh, I really look forward to the three presentations and I look forward to a great discussion. I encourage you to interact with the speakers who are really experts in their fields. Uh, and I'd like to thank the team who worked on organizing this event. Uh, from both the ODI and the SIP sides, and to thank our partner ODI one more time. Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Shukran, Eli, and shukran, um, Catherine, on the um, I thank Eli and Catherine for this uh, introduction, and I would like to um, mention that if you need um, int interpretation, whether from Arabic into English or from English into Arabic, you can uh, choose uh, the Korean uh, option. Unfortunately, uh, that you are seeing on your screen, Korean here stands for Arabic because we don't have the Arabic option in the Zoom parameters. And uh, once again, I reiterate uh, my welcoming to the panelists and participants. And I am really honored to uh, present and moderate this discussion. First, uh, uh, we start with uh, Professor Sultan Barakat, uh, who is uh, the uh, founding director of Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Crisis. Uh, he is a renowned academic, not only in the Arab world, but worldwide. And then we will move to uh, uh, Noor Qais uh, from Sened. And uh, Mr. Eli talked about Sened, uh, which is a civil society organization located in Iraq. And Noor is a university uh, professor in the University of uh, Political Science in uh, Iraq. And then uh, Mrs. Nadwa Al Dawsari, I think she's known to many participants. She's an expert and researcher on tribal issues in Yemen. we we'll start with Mr. Sultan Barakat. The floor is yours. Thank you. Mike, please. The speaker is not using the microphone or is not turning the microphone on. Go ahead. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Catherine and Ali, for this uh, uh, valuable opportunity to be part of this uh, webinar. I'm very pleased to see that there is a cooperation between ODI and USIP focusing on the MENA region. I think uh, it's high time that we work together on this uh, particular region. Uh, I think I have uh, seven to 10 minutes and I will focus on uh, some general uh, points and maybe during the discussion, we can delve deeper. First, regarding COVID-19 and uh, um, conflict-torn uh, regions, I think it's a blessing in disguise because some of uh, these war-torn, uh, conflict-torn regions were besieged and uh, movement in and out was very difficult. And this uh, 
I think was a blessing because the outbreak did not uh, happen as it happened elsewhere uh, in uh, free regions in the world. And uh, uh, Iraq, for example, because of um, the uh, mobility, the intense mobility between Iraq and Iran, I think uh, Iraq can be considered an exception and uh, it was a, a prone and exposed to COVID-19. Mr. Sultan, can you turn on your microphone? We are unable to listen, Mr. Sultan. Unfortunately, I think uh, there is a connection issue, or internet issue with Mr. Sultan. Um, while um, waiting for the connection to be re-established, can we move to Mrs. Noor Qais and then we will give Mr. Sultan the floor when he sorts out uh, his uh, uh, connection issue. I think he's muting his microphone. Uh, Mrs. Noor, are you uh, here? Yes. Mr. Sultan, are you? Uh, we were not able to uh, listen. Unfortunately, I think there is an issue with Mr. Sultan. Um, Mrs. Noor, uh, the floor is yours. Can you give us a, uh, your insight uh, on the impact of COVID-19 uh, in Iraq, on economy, uh, society, and uh, politics and peace building uh, locally? Can you give us uh, an update on what's happening in Iraq? Uh, we will give you the floor and then we will uh, go back to Mr. Sultan when it is possible. Noor, could you please uh, turn on your microphone because we can't hear you. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. I welcome uh, all uh, participants and I commend this very interesting initiative regarding the general uh, repercussions of the uh, pandemic i can say that they were dire and extremely um, negative uh, in general in uh, conflict torn regions in iraq we notice that there is a dire sense of uh, frustration and disillusionment because of loss of jobs, a loss, loss of lives, in addition to a very um, uh, to a rise in political tension, uh, I don't want to jump uh, to conclusions regarding the topics we are talking about today. But let me tell you that uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Iraq is unique of its kind. and It's different from other countries and how it is impacting them. I visited a uh, few uh, neighboring countries uh, in the region and worldwide, and I noticed that there is a huge difference between the situation in Iraq and uh, in uh, other countries, because Iraq is a very uh, exhausted state in terms of uh, infrastructure, very poor infrastructure. And uh, in addition to the escalated tension uh, lately, uh, which uh, compounded the um, negative uh, impact of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Noor. Uh, you um, tackled the fact that there are uh, changes 
at uh, the local levels in the regions in Iraq. And uh, you talked about the dire repercussions uh, in Iraq. And maybe during discussion, you can pinpoint and uh, identify uh, these repercussions on peace building, particularly, and uh, also social cohesion uh, in various regions in Iraq. You also uh, alluded to the differences from one country to the uh, to another. You said that the situation in Iraq is different from Libya, for example, or uh, different from other countries also uh, in the region. We try to um, reestablish connection with Mr. Sultan. Are you with us, sir? Unfortunately, I think Mr. Sultan is still facing uh, internet issues. Uh, uh, we hope that we will be able to listen to his input uh, because I am sure his perspective may be different or interesting and he has also um, a thorough experience in the region. Now we move on to Mrs. Nedwa Adousari. Uh, and she will be talking about uh, the situation in Yemen. I want to tell you that in ODI, we are uh, drafting uh, studies and uh, research pieces on the situation in Yemen and the impact of COVID-19 on economy and politics uh, in the country. And we want to get the uh, insights of uh, Mrs. Nedwa the floor is yours, madam. Thank you, Shireen. Are you uh, listening to me very well? Thank you. I thank uh, ODI and USIP for um, this kind invitation uh, to talk about uh, COVID-19 repercussions on peace building in Yemen. Um, to answer the question regarding COVID-19 repercussions on peace building, I can say yes and no. It's ambivalent because the repercussion was not a direct one. And the local uh, peacemakers in Yemen were not particularly affected by the pandemic. What happened in Yemen is that uh, um, people try to coexist and live with the virus. There were attempts of lockdown and of uh, curfews in more than one region, but uh, they were very short-lived. Uh, people continue to live their lives normally. And we can say that the Yemeni population uh, opted uh, unwittingly to uh, herd immunity. Uh, the Yemeni population, uh, of course, uh, believe in God and believe in faith. And uh, they always say, um, I may catch uh, the virus uh, even when I am at home. So um, most people, and uh, since most people live on um, on day-to-day -day basis, so they can't stay at home and just get salaries. They have to work on day-to-day -day basis. Also, there were some tribal reconciliations and some uh, tribal conflicts were resolved even during the pandemic, exchange of uh, um, hostages also. In May, which is the peak of the uh, outbreak in Aden, there, were, there was an escalation of, uh, a war, of the war between the militia and the government and the uh, main road, the highway, was shut down, but a tribal reconciliation, tribal mediation managed to um, reach a reconciliation between the two uh, warring parties. Uh, there was some negative impact on civil society organizations, despite the fact that uh, many organizations continue to document uh, war crimes and uh, war kidnapping, kidnapping, for example, by a feminist uh, organization, uh, also uh, trying to uh, uncover the fate of uh, abductees and uh, trying to free them. Uh, there was a bit uh, of a bad impact 
on some uh, projects on the ground because of uh, funding issues, because uh, uh, there was a shifting priority from the international community from peace building to combating the virus. Uh, however, there were indirect repercussions, I think, uh, in the Houthi controlled areas. I think the outbreak gave the opportunity to Houthi uh, forces to control, to better control um, their, these areas. Uh, and. Uh, they uh, refuse to share data with uh, any entity uh, external to them. And they also created a, a kind of disinformation. Uh, um, and also they did not uh, let uh, data go out to the, to the, to the world. And they um, threatened to sanction or to uh, punish those um, doctors or those nurses who, who uh, would post uh, pictures or post data about uh, uh, people who have the COVID-19. And uh, so the Houthi were trying to um, muzzle uh, freedom of expression and uh, uh, there was an atmosphere of terror created by the Houthi forces uh, mainly against those who caught the virus uh, there was a criminalization of uh, being sick uh, of having the COVID-19 um, there were rumors also that they are using COVID-19 to get rid of uh, uh, their opponents those who died in the hospital, uh, we don't know whether they really died out of COVID-19 or out of other reasons. So many people um, did not go to the hospital or uh, preferred not to go to the hospital because they feared that uh, going to the hospital would be uh, synonymous uh, to death, whether with COVID-19 or, uh, uh, or because of other um, causes. Uh, this atmosphere of terror uh, was a propitious to more control uh, and uh, more dominance uh, by the Houthis. Um, the material uh, repercussions and the financial repercussions was extremely dire. 80% of uh, money transfer by Yemeni uh, diaspora uh, fell. And uh, that's uh, naturally because many of the Yemeni diaspora lost uh, their jobs uh, abroad. Uh, these money financial transfers are very important because they are, they are the biggest uh, revenues for the state in general. Uh, they, uh, they are between 3.5 to 4 billion uh, dollars. Uh, that's uh, the official figure, but most people transfer money uh, in an informal way uh, through non-official means. And I think they can go up to $10 billion. And I think losing almost 80% of that led to an economic recession. Uh, some were prompted to go to the front to look for uh, jobs or to look for money and to look for income. And that's, I think, a uh, uh, fuel uh, to the war. And uh, one important point is that uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, is an international global priority and not a Yemeni priority. And now we are seeing that all the funding shifted from governance projects, from peace building projects to uh, combating the repercussions of COVID-19. I agree that's important, but we need to find the balance. You can uh, fight the virus. And uh, many, many Yemeni people uh, can can survive the virus, but they can survive hunger and they can survive the war. And that's why we have to strike that very important and very uh, uh, difficult balance. I'm very uh, pleased to answer all your questions if there are questions. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Nedwa. You talked about very important uh, topics. You talked about the uh, priorities of the Yemeni population. Um, focusing on COVID-19 at the expense of other um, important topics or uh, in the mindset of the general population that uh, they have other more urgent priorities and uh, the international uh, and regional organizations have to 
pay more attention to that balance. We, have, we are receiving uh, questions from our audience, but I am keen on um, going back to Mr. Sultan Barakat, but unfortunately, I think we still have a technical issue. Anyway, let's start uh, discussing uh, uh, our panelists, and I have uh, very quick questions uh, to them, and then we will give the floor to Mr. Sultan, if possible, and if we will not manage, I'm sure we will find other ways, uh, and we will uh, ultimately um, include his address in the reporting or the video that we will um, publish later on. And then we will open floor for questions, for a quick for Q&A, actually. Uh, my first question to Mrs. Noor about the situation in Iraq, particularly. In your opinion, Mrs. Noor, what's uh, the repercussion of COVID-19 on the economic uh, scene uh, in Iraq and uh, mainly the war economy as we um, name it in Libya, for example, or Yemen, masks and uh, drugs used to um, against uh, COVID-19 have become a tool uh, used by the, war by the warring parties in order to um, expand their control and the subjugation of different regions. Did you perceive any similar instances in Iraq or can you give us an, a glimpse of what's uh, happening economically because of COVID-19? Thank you, my dear. Uh, I think uh, the economic sector has been hit very hard by uh, COVID-19 in Iraq. Uh, it's uh, almost collapsing and I think the situation is very complex uh, because of the outbreak of uh, the virus worldwide and uh, what led to this uh, very quick economic depression uh, goes to uh, issues pertaining to oil prices We are facing some issues to listen to Mrs. Noor, sorry. Uh, we have different uh, social categories in our society. And I think the most vulnerable category uh, are those who are l living on day-to-day -day basis. Uh, your voice uh, is heard now, but we are not able to see. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I think the um, economic sector in Iraq is uh, uh, most affected more than the social uh, and the political um, spheres because with this pandemic, we uh, also faced a fall or a collapse in oil prices, which make up more than 95% of economic revenues. And also the lockdown that was imposed on a, uh, during a long period in Iraq and the government could not provide alternatives to the citizens. Those who uh, rely on daily income were the most affected and the most vulnerable economically speaking. And uh, regarding the example you have given about Libya, I think what you said about Libya applies to Iraq because we have now a very fertile um, and enterprising uh, business of uh, COVID-19 related items and drugs. Uh, but what's good here is that the Iraqi population are committed to the uh, safety and uh, uh, deterrence uh, gestures, uh, some of them are related to, cult, uh, to the cultural upbringing and some of them are related to the social and economic uh, uh, aspects. Uh, figures in Iraq uh, are not as high as what's happening around the world. Uh, we are between 2,000 and 4,000 uh, uh, in terms of cases on daily basis, but that's uh, dangerous enough because 
the uh, medical infrastructure in Iraq is poor and uh, incapable of accommodating more cases uh, regarding the losses uh, or the number of uh, life losses can also be uh, shocking to people in Iraq today. Uh, for more than 50 days, the government couldn't provide the salaries of governmental civil servants uh, that's considered to be uh, middle class, let alone uh, the vulnerable uh, category I was talking about. That's regarding economic uh, repercussion. Thank you, Mrs. Noor. Uh, Mrs. Nadwa, can you shed more light on the situation in Yemen? And and uh, are people or businesses exploiting the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 either in the north or in the Houthi controlled regions or in, in any other region? Can you give us uh, an idea about the impact of COVID-19 or on war economy particularly? Uh, I agree with uh, Noor. At the beginning of the uh, outbreak of the pandemic, there was fear and uh, people were panic buying uh, uh, masks and uh, the disinfectant gel. And uh, prices were um, shockingly high all over Yemen, in Houthi areas or in governmental uh, held areas. But uh, just as what Noor uh, depicted, uh, people were not uh, committed to the lockdown. Um, uh, ultimately, all, almost everyone uh, tried to live along the virus and coexist with its dangers and risks. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Nadwa. And then I have another question to you, and then we will go back to Mr. Sultan, who is back with us. The second question to Noor and Nadwa pertains to disinformation and uh, misinformation uh, vehicled uh, on social media or on any other means of communication in your communities. And uh, even in the West, we have seen uh, different ways of uh, uh, disinformation and uh, deception uh, on how to handle COVID-19. Do you have um, a comment on disinformation and misinformation? And uh, how did that uh, uh, impact uh, social cohesion and uh, social coexistence, and did it have any impact on the ongoing conflicts in your respective countries? No, go ahead. Thank you. Regarding the misinformation, I think um, we have different drivers and vectors. First, in my opinion, it's fear. Uh, this virus uh, has been a surprise and a shock to the whole world. And uh, I think uh, misinformation uh, is rife because we don't have a deterrence against that. Uh, people who spread such fake news are not held accountable and are not punished. In Iraq also, we have, uh, we have a peculiarity. I don't know if it exists el uh, elsewhere. There are groups that uh, support uh, diffusing some kind of information. For example, people spreading uh, that uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 is a worldwide conspiracy by Americans. So, uh, it's a part of the battle between the world superpowers and uh, us as uh, vulnerable weak states. And uh, some key figures like uh, medical doctors, like uh, key civil society activists, uh, try to exploit uh, this uh, situation to um, market themselves. Uh, and uh, we have an instance of a, a popular doctor, a very famous one, who would post fake uh, 
or misinformation and would uh, deceive people to gain uh, in terms of reputation and uh, in i can give you a particular instance uh, um, where people uh, were uh, belittling the importance of COVID-19. Uh, they were uh, claiming that it is a false um, virus, that there is no violence virus and you have to believe in God and believe in the fate God has determined for us. So all of that I consider to be drivers for misinformation. And I think ultimately the problem is that we did not have accountability for such uh, deeds and that led to loss of lives in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. Nadwa, the floor is yours. Regarding misinformation in Yemen, regardless of the COVID-19 situation, the Houthis are the best and uh, in terms of using misinformation very effectively and they thrived on that in during covid uh, the covid pandemic as i said they wanted to uh, uh, subjugate and spread terror and uh, the houthis also uh, abdul malik al houthi their leader he said that uh, or claimed that uh, um, uh, American companies created this biological product to uh, to spread it all over the world, and, uh, and that was uh, an information that was widely diffused on social media. Uh, the Minister of Health, uh, the Houthi Minister of Health, said also that uh, Yemeni doctors are trying to uh, produce uh, vaccine and uh, that Yemen will uh, be the country providing the vaccination to the whole world. Uh, I don't can say that there were a lot of misinformations, but uh, I, I can say that there was a lot of momentum in terms of uh, this information in some of the Houthi channels. Some we have seen some people uh, saying that instead of uh, dying out of uh, uh, the COVID-19, you can fight on the front and you will not uh, die uh, after uh, contracting the virus. Uh, instead, you will die as a martyr if ever you will die. Uh, that was one of the uh, narratives widely um, diffused. In the first case uh, recognized by the Houthi government, they said that it was a Somali migrant, but that's that was not true. It was not a, a Somali migrant. That's an attempt to put the blame on others, on uh, on people who are external to their to their group, and they always try to picture. Uh, themselves as in control and uh, that uh, the regions under their control are safe and immune and the only threat can come from outside. So when they started uh, admitting cases, they claimed that these cases came from uh, the areas of the government. And that's not true because the Houthi areas uh, are closed up and uh, um, from travelers who come from abroad. Thank you. Thank you. You focused on uh, ways through which uh, the COVID-19 um, has been politicized in Iraq and Yemen and uh, ways through which the COVID-19 has been used to spread terror and uh, to serve political agendas for the different warring parties on the ground. I want to move from the two cases of Yemen and Iraq to the whole MENA region. And now we'll focus on that with Mr. Sultan Barakat and with particular attention to Syria, the situation in Syria. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, did you listen to my intervention, the first one? We only heard the two minutes. So can you summarize that and then move on with your speech? Uh, I apologize uh, for this interruption. I wish I could listen to uh, Noor and Nadwa because I think that they have very interesting uh, ideas. Uh, I will repeat what I said. Uh, wars and conflicts, just as Neda said, uh, limit mobility. And uh, the limited mobility curbed the spread of uh, the virus in some regions, with a few exceptions, like Iraq and uh, the uh, intense movement between Iran and Iraq. So we can consider that Iraq was an exception, but uh, Gaza Strip, uh, the Houthi regions, uh, regions in Syria, I think that these areas were enjoyed a blessing in disguise. And uh, to focus on uh, COVID-19's repercussion on peace building locally, and uh, whether that is uh, positive or a negative, I think in general, uh, the repercussion will be negative and dire because this pandemic uh, added fuel to fire uh, in more than one community and one economy. Many countries in the region will be uh, suffering from high rates of uh, indebtedness because of, uh, of uh, the resources they have devoted to fighting COVID-19 and also due to the lockdown and the isolation they imposed on themselves, uh, trying to emulate some Western countries. This led to spend, overspending in the region. And I think in the next two, region, uh, two years, we'll see the repercussions, the dire repercussions of that, mainly in countries which suffer politically, like Lebanon, Syria, and uh, Jordan. I think we can see uh, community cracks and social uh, divisions already springing. And uh, in terms of the repercussion also, some despotic regimes uh, used COVID-19 as a pretext to uh, uh, engage in lockdowns. Some of them I consider random and excessive and also to spread rumors, to stigmatize certain uh, groups or certain denominations because of the virus. Uh, of course, this virus is a, uh, uh, some, uh, some groups have vehicled that it is a global conspiracy that, that subscribes, of course, to this uh, conspiracy theory and uh, I can't partake in that uh, logic, of course. There were opportunities to benefit from COVID-19. To change the orientation of uh, certain um, resources in some countries. For example, in uh, raising certain statistics and linking mortalities to COVID-19 uh, only in a bet to get more funding um, some, uh, some assistance and uh, support, I think, um, ultimately uh, went to the wrong hands and not to the uh, communities that uh, have a dire need for them. I want to make an observation also about COVID-19 causing more and more poverty in many regions and at the same time, conversely, 
uh, it um, was a driver of uh, civil society work and volunteerism in Lebanon and Jordan. And it was a breakaway from the um, social divisions and religious divisions that these communities suffer from. But these um, instances were not were not consistent uh, uh, at an international dimension. Uh, the Secretary General uh, uh, called for a global ceasefire to help uh, overcome COVID-19 repercussions, but I don't think that these developing countries uh, responded positively to this call, mainly in terms of uh, providing assistance. Uh, what, uh, what we perceive is that uh, devel even developed countries uh, try to get the assistance for themselves and there was an unhealthy competition worldwide uh, and the expenses uh, dispersed on COVID-19 were primarily in, uh, co uh, for consumption, for uh, the protection equipment and uh, drugs and so on and so forth. So they can't really be considered a real development in these countries. And uh, many of them uh, were imported from abroad. In Idlib, in Syria, for example, which uh, was subject to violence uh, in the beginning of 2020, some non-governmental organizations worked hard to shift from emergency work to long-term development and sustainable work. But the advent of COVID-19 um, stopped all of that because these organizations found that, uh, found themselves obliged to deal with the COVID-19 repercussions and uh, new uh, newly found issues. One of the main challenges that the region will face is a reconstruction and peace building in a sustainable manner in the future. Um, due to the economic depression and recession, the region will be uh, draw, uh, will drawn in and uh, also the political um, concessions the region will have to do in order to get the assistance it needs to overcome um, COVID-19 repercussions for Palestine, Lebanon, Syria. Here I talk about uh, normalization with Israel and uh, the new borders between Lebanon and Israel. Uh, all of that will be used as a pressure in order to facilitate these uh, objectives and will reflect, uh, will have a negative reflection on the region. Uh, regarding peace building and uh, mediation, I noted down some observations uh, after uh, my engagement in Afghan mediation work and in Yemen also. The pandemic uh, made uh, opportunities of face to face uh, communication very scarce and unlikely. Same for uh, political talks, and that had negative impact, but also positive impact from another perspective because it can be used as a research topic. Uh, uh, give you the example of using Zoom and uh, other virtual platforms, which uh, created um, new opportunities and allowed for more engagement uh, for people all over the world engaging with each other that was very unlikely uh, in the past because of lack of funding. You know how difficult it is to get someone from Yemen, of course, to go and uh, um, attend a meeting in any Arab country or European countries. So I think that's a, an opportunity to be seized. And uh, the second point I want to shed light is uh, establishing and restoring trust in those 
who are engaged in these political talks, um, they can record the meeting and they can note things and that's uh, something that was not possible in the past. What we missed, however, is uh, the human contact and the direct contact because many of these political talks uh, which used to take place uh, around lunch or uh, around dinner are not possible now. And um, the pandemic also uh, alleviated the uh, difficulties of certain political talks with few exceptions, uh, like uh, Sudan a reconciliation agreement between the government and uh, the militias in Juba. Uh, it took place in a very difficult situation, actually, and uh, the government of the South uh, took all precautions in terms of COVID-19. Uh, however, Doha uh, opened talks on September uh, between an, Af an Afghan uh, group uh, or for a group uh, representing the government and uh, uh, militia groups and uh, they drafted a protocol on uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, prevention and uh, uh, I think uh, that was a very good opportunity and uh, everyone was uh, uh, scrutinized uh, in order to make the opportunity and the discussion safe for everyone. Uh, some of the speakers or the attendees uh, opposed the use of uh, new technologies uh, uh, like uh, the Qatar uh, system called Ahtiraz, which classifies people in terms of uh, green or orange or red. Um, some of uh, some people consider that this is uh, an intrusion of privacy and it can lead to um, spying. Uh, people with diploma diplomatic passports were exempted, but uh, that was a venture actually for Qatar to host uh, such uh, high level talks. It was a, a risk. Uh, some other countries did not venture into that. The positive dimension is that uh, there was a competition uh, between countries to host these talks, but with the uh, outbreak of COVID-19, many countries uh, withdrew themselves because they did not want new problems uh, uh, in addition to COVID-19. And that paved the way for Qatar and uh, uh, made all stakeholders focus more on the key objective issues they are deliberating and uh, the need to engage in these talks uh, in a, an earnest manner. Uh, finally, maybe the next couple of days, we'll publish a res research piece on uh, the, u the safe use of technology and uh, not everyone has uh, access to technology, unfortunately, but now uh, I'm talking about technology, but now uh, I think I am uh, uh, an evidence of uh, issues uh, that c that we can face because of technology. Uh, ultimately, I can say that uh, there are opportunities in technology, but we have to explore more um, in terms of privacy and security. And for moderators also, uh, it will give them an opportunity to control interruptions and to organize uh, interventions and uh, make the discussion run smoothly. Uh, these are uh, good points to be uh, capitalized upon in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sultan. Thank you for your uh, uh, thorough, comprehensive uh, talk about the COVID-19 repercussions on the MENA region and also your uh, particular drawing on um, technology 
and uh, the creation of a propitious conducive environment for talks that uh, otherwise could only uh, take place face to face but now thanks to zoom and webex uh, it has become possible and easier and uh, you also mentioned the risks uh, pertaining to pri privacy and security which are underlying these uh, technologies and the negative use of such technologies now, i would like to um, open the floor for questions and we have a number of questions from uh, our audience. The first question is about the role or the issues pertaining to governance in the MENA region and uh, and um, is our, the extreme focus on COVID-19 a kind of misinformation deluding us to the biggest problem in the Middle East which is governance and corruption? This is the first question. I don't know who would like to take it. Mr. Sultan, would you, li would you like to take it? I think uh, uh, the lockdown has, uh, has been used excessively and people could not perceive the logic why uh, lockdown um, on Thursday and Friday uh, and uh, not the other days. Uh, uh, some interpret this as a way to impede uh, Friday sermons or to uh, not to allow people to pray. Uh, that's of course uh, some Salafist uh, hardliners. Uh, some economic businesses also uh, complained about that. Uh, entertainment businesses also schools and I think uh, all countries uh, around the world faced such uh, um, instances and issues because of these disagreements um, the particular disagreements in the Arab world in terms of denominations religious uh, affiliations we uh, tend to become aggressive in our interpretations and I think decision makers had to pay more attention to that for example, refugee camps and the lockdown on the refugee camps for their safety and health, but you are crippling them and uh, um, uh, you are stifling them economically speaking. So all of these uh, matters have to be thought about thoroughly in order to uh, apply the principle of do no harm. Uh, how can I ensure the general health and the security while taking into account peace building and uh, also um, community reconciliation? Every step taken in our region caused enough bloodshed and uh, and I think we should have been more precautious uh, in uh, the adoption of such drastic measures and uh, now i have a question to mrs noor about the situation in iraq uh, has covid 19 had a particular impact on uh, religious minorities and ethnic minorities in iraq thank you uh, uh, minorities in iraq did not uh, enjoy a uh, better situation than others. I think uh, all citizens uh, suffer from very poor services uh, that applies to everyone. Uh, maybe minorities, and I'm talking here based on direct uh, um, testimonies of uh, minorities I know in Iraq. Uh, they themselves say that uh, um, the suffering applies to everyone and is relevant to everyone. Um, what they have uh, suffered the most is uh, the delay of uh, resolving some of their own issues. Uh, for instance, 
we have uh, projects uh, directed to um, ethnicities and minorities in Sahel Nainawa, for example, for example uh, dialogue sessions aiming to resolve the conflict between uh, Sharkas and uh, uh, Christians and uh, uh, also the Azidi camp issues. I think they were they were impacted negatively by COVID-19 pandemic, mainly during the lockdown. Uh, after that, um, with the, the restoration of ordinary life, or, uh, they have um, managed to uh, restore negotiation and mediation, but not as it was prior to COVID-19. Uh, I can. I want to add something as uh, the uh, Iraqi government is focusing exclusively on on the general issues of the country and not the issues pertaining to minorities. For example, they are keen and focusing on resolving the economic issues, on the political tension and uh, the pressures they are um, subject to from the external powers. So in terms of the agenda and priorities, I think that COVID-19 uh, led to the um, downsizing and uh, belittling the importance of uh, the issues of minorities. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Noor. I have uh, the next question directed to Mrs. Nadwa uh, about the best strategies through which we can help Yemen uh, to combat COVID-19. mainly in, a, in the light uh, of lack of technology and uh, also we don't have exact figures uh, as to the number of people who um, have COVID-19 and also the, the unlikelihood of uh, uh, social distancing and lockdown and uh, precaution measures as it was uh, as it is in other countries because of the dire economic situation so mrs nedwa what is the best we can do in this light i will answer this question but let me uh, go back to the governance issue first neglecting uh, governance issues uh, in favor of covid 19 is not new uh, it has been uh, frequent in the past and uh, common enough local uh, the international community and the international organizations either uh, neglect um, the demands of local uh, organizations or they try to use them to serve them uh, and their interests for example uh, in the past, before COVID-19, they were supporting the national dialogue uh, and the national reconciliation, and ultimately it failed. So there is a tendency from the international community and uh, international donors, of the, uh, they are obsessed with the immediate issues. Now they are uh, obsessed with the, the mediation uh, by the UN envoy, um, between the government and the Houthi, Houthis. But this mediation uh, led by the UN uh, is facing a lot of issues and uh, there are a lot of intricacies. But all what we are seeing here is that all the support is being channeled to, to that mediation while ignoring local priorities like governance. Uh, now we can support economy, we can uh, support uh, security, for example, with uh, um, international donations, but there is a total rejection and um, there is an obsession with um, the peace process led by the UN envoy, which is being questioned by many Yemeni people. I think the process is uh, uh, mired with flaws, but uh, anyway, that's, I think, the principle being applied by the international community. They neglect and ignore altogether 
the local privacy or they try to uh, exploit them or orchestrate them to serve international interests and uh, they put conditions uh, working on these local issues while they should support uh, the international endeavors and uh, i think that's a big mistake made by the international community we should not focus on only one process uh, because that process can be doomed uh, and uh, regarding your question uh, supporting a man to co overcome COVID-19 major superpowers are facing difficulties to overcome COVID-19 like uh, the US for example but um, the support has to be sustainable and uh, as I said, we can support local governance in certain areas. We can support the security sector reform and uh, the international community can implement programs to alleviate the suffering of Yemeni population. Uh, this community, of course, in our community, we don't have a state per se, and uh, we are facing uh, challenges way harder and dire than more dire than the virus and what it poses. The next question is related to what we have uh, discussed and uh, in the Middle East and in conflict-torn countries. Do you agree that there is a um, lack of awareness about the risk and the danger uh, of the virus because of other agendas uh, that are more forceful like the war agenda that makes people uh, unable to focus on the virus and its risks because they are more preoccupied with the uh, with war and if it is the case are there uh, organizations or institutions on the ground providing medical services and uh, trying to do medical outreach uh, about COVID-19 while the conflict or the war is being managed by other actors and stakeholders and uh, uh, endeavoring to alleviate the level of and uh, mitigate the level of violence. So there are, are there uh, different actors playing on these different dimensions? I think Mrs. Nadwa uh, can answer this question and then Noor. Yes, of course, there are institutions locally working on different dimensions. There are civil society organizations and uh, young leaders uh, who have done an excellent job. Uh, youth initiatives uh, using WhatsApp or Facebook, for example, or very simple videos explaining with very local and simple language how population can uh, protect themselves. And that was a very uh, laudable initiative. But there are also uh, effective civil society organizations and local uh, authorities uh, that need to be supported. There are uh, medical doctors and groups of doctors uh, who launched a very good initiative and they can be supported. And they need to be supported. Most of the medical doctors do not receive their salaries. So maybe they can be incentivized or uh, provided with their salaries many medical doctors left uh, their jobs because they were not protected and many other doctors died because of the uh, the pandemic so there are ways and means and possibilities of supporting official and non-official institutions that can make a pivotal shift if supported and provided with assistance mrs noor do you have uh, a comment on um, local and um, governmental institutions. In Iraq, there are uh, institutions uh, suffering from a kind of chaos, uh, a chaos um, created uh, with the misinformation and disinformation and uh, the rumors about uh, the COVID-19. From the first uh, uh, outbreak uh, until today, uh, we have uh, governmental authorities and institutions working seriously and uh, earnestly uh, on combating the virus. Uh, 
doing outreach, for example. The government also created a high commission and uh, we have a, a newsletter uh, explaining uh, different figures pertaining to the COVID. We don't know and we are not sure whether these figures are accurate or not, but there are governmental and civil society uh, efforts to uh, raise awareness and sensitize uh, on the field and on social media. There are key um, social and community figures in the Iraqi society which uh, made uh, excellent achievements. For example, Saadun, uh, he has a daily uh, video, he posts a daily video about uh, COVID-19 developments. I think we can't consider that those who are doing outreach and those who are doing disinformation, I don't think that they are clashing. Uh, they are in a blatant conflict that is, but whenever we have someone spreading this information, we have a wave uh, countering that discourse and uh, debunking this. And uh, I, I can tell you that there are very good endeavors uh, undertaken by uh, reputable and renowned figures in our communities. We still have only 50 uh, or 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, we have a question to Mr. Sultan about the dialogue in Syria. Was there a clear uh, impact, uh, blatant and uh, conspicuous repercussion on um, the situation in Syria and are there Syrian institutions that are playing a role in peace building currently? The floor is yours, Mr. Sultan, and then we will um, conclude. Unfortunately, there are questions that we couldn't take, but maybe there will be future opportunities to answer uh, on social media or on other platforms. Mr. Sultan, go ahead. Mr. Sultan, can you turn on your mic? As far as I know, in August, um, the uh, official peace talks between uh, the Syrian government and um, the Syrian militias were delayed because of uh, three positive cases, but that did not lead to the total suspension of talks. They were just delayed. And uh, uh, after a few weeks, uh, they managed to resume the talks with a less uh, number of uh, uh, people involved. And uh, they, as I said, they continued ba uh, back then in Geneva. Regarding the local institutions, uh, they are working, they are still working on the ground uh, under a lot of pressure uh, due to the economic situation and all the other uh, repercussions pertaining to COVID-19. But I don't think that uh, the virus in itself will uh, stop or uh, put an end to the peace talks or will, would deter people from finding solutions to their conflicts, not only in Syria, but uh, anywhere in the Middle East, uh, people are jaded and they are trying to find uh, solutions to their problems. So I don't think that the virus itself uh, will impede on these aspirations. And uh, uh, that's why we have, as I said, to strike a balance, a very uh, unlikely balance between uh, health and uh, peace building and uh, we have to um, capitalize on the serious endeavors as I said in South Sudan and uh, Qatar these two countries exemplify uh, risk taking by uh, hosting uh, talks that's an investment actually and uh, it has its cost uh, when they came to Qatar uh, before uh, taking the flight, they were tested and then they uh, were on lockdown uh, or they were in isolation, sorry. And, uh, and then uh, they were tested again during the, uh, uh, 
during their arrival in Qatar and, and then they were assigned different colors in Iraq, green, uh, yellow or red. Uh, yellow were quarantined and the red uh, were uh, in isolation actually. Uh, these are all ideas that have to be uh, thought over and have to be invested. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sultan. I thank all speakers and uh, uh, Mr. Ali and uh, Mrs. Catherine. And uh, at the end, I want to reiterate uh, the key points we discussed with our panelists today. The first point that COVID-19 is not only a health risk, but a, a risk uh, politically and socially and economically, but we have to reorder and reshuffle our priorities and uh, um, assimilate and grasp the local perspectives and not just the international and global perspectives. Uh, similar to what Nedwa said, um, um, interest in the COVID-19 uh, is an international priority, not necessarily a local priority, and we have to uh, strike a balance between uh, the local priorities and interests and the international interests and interventions. And uh, there are uh, many challenges pertaining to disinformation around COVID-19 and the politicization uh, by different uh, warring parties, uh, such as what's happening in Yemen or in Iraq and uh, the exploitation of uh, vulnerable categories and uh, of displaced people. And of course, uh, these vulnerable categories are or face a greater challenge and greater risk. And that's why they have to be supported and assisted. Uh, despite this gloomy uh, perspective, there are uh, positive uh, impact, uh, like an increase in civil society uh, volunteering work and many organizations working on outreach uh, from a sanitary perspective while also continuing their work socially uh, and economically and they have to be supported and they have we have to grasp and understand their own priorities from their own perspective and finally uh, international support and assistance has to be uh, revisited and reviewed focusing on COVID-19 without understanding the other issues pertaining to governance, uh, to politics and to economies uh, can uh, create or produce an even more difficult situation. And uh, the forms of competition we have today worldwide does not help communities and uh, countries trying to overcome uh, COVID-19 pandemic and as well as other uh, social and political issues. I hope that uh, international organizations that uh, attended and listened to the discussion today sh share ODI and USIP and uh, Qatar, Qatar Center share with us and work with us on creating this new and much needed balance to take into account the local priorities and uh, local interests and not just the international priorities and uh, um, uh, technology for example and the webinar is an evidence of that technology has created opportunities for dialogue and for mediation and reconciliation but at the same time it can be an obstacle in many forms and fashions. And uh, I hope that we can uh, review uh, issues pertaining to technological privacy and security and uh, the limitations of uh, technology and uh, technological security in the Middle East. I would like to, to express my appreciation and thanking to the panelists. Uh, we have only one minute. I wanted to give the floor to Eli and Catherine to conclude, but I 
we can't unfortunately i hope that this is just uh, the beginning of uh, our collaboration and uh, i hope we will have other opportunities of uh, virtual meetings or face-to-face -face meetings i apologize also for the technical issues uh, and i hope we'll have other opportunities to discuss such uh, significant matters thank you very much and see you soon thank you